came to work for firm. He went into Book Corner. Uh -huh. you know, and he, years ago, he, he moved here, I think, in, 19, in 2009 from Chicago because his wife got a job with Cook. She does email, email marketing for their devices oh, at, okay. at Cook. So that's his. That's what brought him to Bloomington. So he's he was a he was a uh, freelance freelance writer in Chicago. Work, uh -huh. This works, and and he went into Book Corner. And Margaret, Margaret, the woman who runs, the, you know her. Mm -hmm. She said, "I I came in the store while he was there," and she said, "You've got to talk to that woman, Michael. You have to write her <laughs> memoir." Oh, that was Margaret's idea. She said, she said, she's, she's an important person, an influential person. You just have to learn to know her. That's what you have to do. So <laughs> then he called me and he said, I've been told that I have to learn to know you. Oh, that's great. And that sounds said, like Margaret, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Yeah. And my, it sounds like Michael too. So we set up a time he came over and talked and he said, so I would like to write your memoir. And I said, why would you do that? And he said, because I'm, because Margaret tells me you're very interesting. Yeah, well. I, I'll say, well, let's see about that. Hmm. I said, I'm not sure that that's true, but no, and I'm not sure anybody cares. But, oh. but he, we started talking and he said, we, so then we, he started taping, recording me. And we spent quite a bit of time in the early months recording conversations. He'd ask me a question and then, I would carry on forever, and then he'd ask me a question, and he carried, he kept all that. And he said, "I'm I just then he he wasn't sure what he was going to do with it, how he was going to do it, and he thought about it and thought about it and thought about it, and decided on this back and forth thing. Okay, it seemed to me a really good idea. We agreed that that would that sounded okay. Yeah, I think it worked out really well because um, I just felt like you know you were you were telling your story so well, but then every once in a while he'd interject like just some historic history or just something that was right. like relevant. And, and I thought, oh, well that's, it helped me because I didn't always know the context. So I thought it right. was really a good way of putting it together. Yeah, and then he, he pretty much, so we, we, you know, we worked on it for several years. He got cancer in the middle, as you probably know. He, oh yeah, I knew he'd been sick, yeah. yeah. And there was, you know, there was some question when he, he had to take a time off. And, and then this gestated in his head and he thought about it. And when he came back, he came back and said, I've got it all worked out. Yeah, sometimes stepping back from a project's the best thing you can do, I think. Yeah. Even if it's not yeah. your desired way of stepping back, you know. Right. And so then we would, you know, he'd ask me more questions to fill in. And then he'd go out and fact check. I said, you don't believe me? He said, I believe you, but let's just <laughs> check it out. Yeah, he's just doing his job, right? <laughs> he's done just doing my job, exactly yeah. right. And so, wow. so we went back and forth for another year and a half or so. And then- So how then, long did it take to write it with I him? Would say, I would say it was six, weeks, six years from start to finish. Mm -hmm. you know, and meanwhile, I'm working on another book and, and you know, which is about this 1971 election. And that's specific, very specifically a chronicle about what about the when the Democrats took over Bloomington. Oh, I'd be really and, interested and, in that. And and the you know the details of how that worked because uh -huh. I think that's an important story, and a lot of people and other people think it's an important story because it really was it was a bunch of of neophytes taking over a, the the. Uh, taking over the government in this town that was pretty pretty st stayed and in high bound mm -hmm. but we did it very methodically very carefully and we did it we did it well and then you know, pretty and clearly then we, and then we had to and then we had to govern but that was what i said it's like the manchuri the no not the manchuri the candidate the robert redford at the beginning oh. of at the end of the candidate he finished. right right yeah and I'm now, not much of a movie buff <laughs> <laughs> so so 1971 was when you joined the city council right yes that's yeah, right and and were you right away made the president of the city yes, council I was, yeah so right I was away the first, I was the first president 
And I think that was because I worked, you know, I worked, I was a, I was a mere housewife. That means I, I had more time than they did. A mere housewife with a PhD in linguistics. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and yeah. And two children, right. And two children. I know. And a yeah. wonderful, wonderful, fortunately, a wonderful husband, mm -hmm. a really good husband. So anyway, but you know, yeah, I was on the street. I was on campaign door to door, you know, door mm -hmm. literally door to door. We didn't right. stop with Repub we didn't avoid Republicans or, or independents. We went door to door mm. and talked to people and ask them what 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 they what concerned them, you know, and and we we didn't go out with telling them what we were going to do necessarily until we talked to a lot of them and got an idea of what what was on people's minds. And that's then the way we, it should be. And that's right. And, and, and just in the last couple of days, I've had a, I've had a, a, a kind of epiphany. And that was that we didn't only change government, we changed the way people did everything here. And we, we, what we did was we started, we opened, we, we, when we started governing, we said, we asked the people to join, help us govern. And we started creating all these, these um, um, blue ribbon committees and, and work for mm -hmm. and, and, and just different kinds of opportunities for people to, to attack a different issue. So yeah. were a lot of the tasks, task force started then? Yes, a lot of the task forces. Mm -hmm. Yep, starting right away, and then in the even in let me say the first meeting that we had where we invited everybody to come and you know be be there and help us, which is not what governments usually do. No, <laughs> no. not usually. <laughs> and and we and we had 150 people or more at that first meeting, and we were there for ne for nearly four hours, not just going over and over the same thing, but just going down the list of people who come with, with their particular concern. And at that meeting, for example, there was a woman who came and talked about healthcare. She was particularly concerned. There was, there was a shelter, something like what, what evolved into middle way actually. Mm -hmm. but, but it was dealing particularly with people with venereal diseases as we called them, and also with drug overdoses. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that we had to do something about that. There were no, and so we, we immediately formed a, a little task force for, for drug overdoses and for remedial diseases. And what happened was that Planned Parenthood, which was just really getting into gear, mm -hmm. uh, decided, decided they, would, they would pick up the venereal disease issue and the community mental health center would start dealing with drug overdoses, which they hadn't been doing. But, so we were... That happened just like that. And then there was a group of, of business people from the square. Bob Hammondtree ran, ran a pair, printing company on the north side of the square. Who and was he, it? Bob Hammondtree, hmm. H-A-M-O-N-T-R-E. And he and, and a bunch of his friends thought that we should be recycling paper. And so he, he picked up the recycling issue. And he, we paired him with a student who was very, there was a student group in Perth that was interested in recycling and we got them together. And you know, out of that came some minimal recycling. But, but it, more, more importantly, it got this group of people working with that group of people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it occurred to me that that really began to change the whole nature of the, of the town because we had people who never knew each other working with people who never knew each other doing and working on projects together mm -hmm. and and that happened in one area after the other i mean in food and in the in our in the arts so you were seeing the 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 way the whole town operated basically changing and, yes. and evolving at that point and you were central to that happening so yes yeah you know and then my friend my my partner marilyn and i started goods on the uh -huh. square, we did it intentionally on the square. And yeah, I, I remember you said that in the book. Yeah, and then the Argentum came in too. 
So at the, at the very same time, and suddenly we had two locally owned businesses help it. And people would say, why are you going downtown? We said, because we, that'll save the square. That's the only thing that'll save the, the, the square is yeah. locally owned business, but that, mm -hmm. that, that know their product and you know, are willing to work on it. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it was really one thing after another in retrospect. And I really never thought about it quite that way until the other day for some reason. It's because I was annoyed about what's happening with the Waldron and the possibility of not keeping the Waldron as an art center, which was also a community project, both yeah. the Buzzker Chumley and the Wal. So I'm gonna write an article about that. Are you gonna write like an op-ed to the newspaper? No, I'm gonna write an article for somebody. I think Peter Lopalato said he would print it. Uh-huh. Well, you know, probably Malcolm Abrams at Bloomwood, too. Oh, that's a good idea. Yes. Yeah, because I Malcolm is such a big supporter of the arts, and oh, I think Malcolm. I think he'd be happy. And that gets a pretty good distribution, too. Well, so. well I think what, what I think really happened, and we didn't really, you know, you, you, you don't know it when it's happening, is that people in the community began to feel... I have a good idea, and now I think I could. I, I'm going to throw it out there because good ideas are being picked up and happen, turning into projects. And and that's what happened in in the healthcare and in the arts, in small business. And I have a list of them, and I can't always think of it. But yeah. in many many are in the rest in food in food. You know, we had only one decent, really good restaurant in town, and but you know eventually we, we have more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that sounds like it's a really important book to write because I sometimes, I think people in Bloomington right now are beginning to realize how good we've had it for a long time. And maybe, you know, the way things are kind of turning around right now, which some people aren't very happy about, is kind of the way most cities are run. So I That's think, right. you know, so I kind of feel like we've had it really good for a long time and it takes work to keep it that way yes. and electing the right people to keep it that way, you know? It should, it should be on the table. Yeah, but yeah. you know, I think what's happened in Spencer is pretty pretty interesting. It sounds to me <laughs> like the same sort of thing. Yeah, well, Owen County is an interesting place. I'm glad the Bredens are here. <laughs> yes, I think you should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that, that um, from what I've seen in the almost three years I've been in business here is that there's just so much of Bloomington moving this way. Yes. And um, you know, I, the people who have the good ideas, they're going to go somewhere where they're valued rather than where they're being told that that's not what the, the powers that be want them to do. Yeah, or where they can just afford it. I mean, I like the can book. Afford it. You, you, meant, you know, it seems like you were very, very, very conscious of lower income people and taking yes. care of them and and um, making services and and buildings and everything available to all people instead of just a, an upper class. And that became really evident through reading your book too. And I think that was, that made a huge difference. That's nice, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I but mean, I was, just was so impressed to read all the things you did. Well, one of the things I realized, you know, I, I have a PhD and I can do, I could not get a decent job in Bloomington in, I mean, at the university. They would just, keep me, they would keep me on paying me little, and you know, because they, they could get away with it. And I said, no, and, and then I thought, but, uh, but now I don't have anything to do. And I knew a lot of other women who, who also felt that way. But I also realized that, that in, the, in, in Woolworth and Kresge and you know, the really low, in, low, low range paying jobs, those were, were currently being held by women who didn't have much education. And we were taking those jobs away from them Hmm. And that seemed to me just counterproductive right? for right. everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's why, yep. You know, so, for, yeah. So Charlotte, I just got your book from uh, Jamie's last Friday. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I'm about uh, halfway through it. In fact, I just got to the election, 71. Uh -huh. So 
I've just read, you know, you have been elected and now you're going to be inaugurated. So that's the chapter I'm on. Um, <clears throat> and it was just, it's been a, it's been a ride to see where all you've been, where you came from, you know, yeah. where you've traveled, where, uh, how you came up with some of your ideas. And uh, I'm enjoying that. I'm enjoying, uh, you know, this, cause I don't know you well. I know yeah, you yeah. peripherally from, right. from just seeing you in your hats around town and, and knowing you're a power to be reckoned with, but I don't know you well. So it's been really interesting to me to, to hear your background, to see where you've come from and, and how through the years you have honed this person that is independent, that does have a her own and that will not just be pushed in the back corner because she is just a housewife or whatever. And uh, so I've really appreciated that. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of it. It gets yeah. tougher, it gets tougher. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, well, you're only halfway through her journey, as, as, and, and hopefully she's still only halfway through her journey. But, but well, that would be I, interesting. <laughs> but one of the things that really, really impressed me, Charlotte, was that you are very independent and you do have ideas. But what impressed me, I think, the most about most of your stories was that you just kept asking questions instead of. You might have had a thought, but you didn't necessarily push that thought through. You would ask so, so many questions. And even when you didn't know exactly what was going on, if you had a hunch, you would ask questions. Yeah. And it, it was really interesting to me, especially when we got to the incinerator story. I was just like, I couldn't read it fast enough. I was just so engrossed in that story because I moved down to Bloomington in like well, I started coming down here and I'm from Indianapolis in about 75, 76 coming down and then moved here in 78. And I can just remember what, you know, just all that going on, but I was young and I wasn't quite as involved or paying quite as much attention. So it was really interesting to read about the incinerator. And it just, it sounds like there would have been an incinerator if it wasn't for you. I think that's, I actually I mean, modestly think that's true. Oh, I, after reading your book and everything you were up against, it sounds like absolutely. And you just kept going to visit all the different locations where there were incinerators and you got all that information about how bad things were going in those places. Well, they were, it, it was, it was hilarious actually. You tell me it's safe. Excuse me. Why did you put that six foot by eight foot steel door down the auger? And it, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So, it so I just, really, you know, I want to say asking questions is my, is my modus operandi, mm -hmm. yeah, asking questions. And I, but I, when I was on the board of trustees at Indiana State, I don't know if this is in the book or not. I ask a lot of questions and, and I got a letter from the vice president at the time of the board saying, Charlotte, this is it all. He said, you haven't been on the board for very long, but you should understand that in, at ISU, the trustees do not ask questions. You did, you did touch, I can't remember if you like actually quoted that letter. Yeah. You, I think you might've, but yes, you did talk about kind of being chastised about that. I was chastised mm -hmm. yeah, and I didn't, I wasn't be, I didn't have a, an obedient response. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's yeah that's what I like about you <laughs> as far as I know as far as <laughs> tell them tell them we we need to play cribbage again I will we've been playing it every day like three uh -oh. times a day since the since the shutdown started and uh, I didn't I was, know that <laughs> I was feeding him you can tell him okay we wish him well yeah yep so Charlotte, to go back to the beginning kind of part of the book when, well, it's not the beginning, but I mean, earlier on in the book where you were talking about living in Czechoslovakia, I thought that was a very interesting um, and adventurous 
it was it was expedition for you and to bring your children into that and i kind of was wondering a little bit if you would just talk a little bit more about how how that felt and to have your children there and if your children have memories of of being there i know that nathan was really young then right yes yeah nathan was young they were both young he was five the day we had landed in copenhagen uh-huh and and so he was in my, Rebecca was two years older. Uh -huh. and, oh, very young, yeah. She, yeah, so she was in, in school in the first class in a school that where they taught English. So, so she was treated like a queen because the children in, the, in that school were the children of professionals, doctors mm -hmm. and lawyers and mm -hmm. whatever there were left of individual of professionals in Czechoslovakia. Whereas Nathan was in a daycare center and and he was in in a school with children of high government high communist officials and they cut him no slack poor kid they wow. they just he had to speak slovak even if he even if he didn't understand anything and he had to eat food he didn't like and he had to wear clothes he didn't like he had to change into pajamas for his nap poor kid <laughs> so anyway he's turned out okay has he forgiven you <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 we talk about it occasionally. I ask him, you know, do you remember? The, I think I talk about his his big excitement, which was when they when they were he came home one day, for and he spoke Slovak beautifully. He he learned the language faster than any of us. Yeah, and, here if you're if if you're like five or under, you can learn a language yeah, really yeah. quickly. Yeah, he could even. Trill his hours, I can't do it. Wow. He had a friend named Igor Krimpatsky, and I, I, loved, I made him say it over and over again because he was so good at it. Anyway, <sighs> but, but he came home one day and he said, he was all excited and he said, we're going to do, I'm, mom, yeah, we're going to do this great thing. He had a big white hoop with him and, and a, a little red onesie. <laughs> and he said, they were going to they were going to go to the soccer field to the soccer stadium thousands of little children his age were going to go to the soccer field and they were going to do gymnastic tricks with the hoops and so forth and this was going to be very exciting and i said why are you doing that and he said well he said we're going to celebrate because it's lenin's birthday lenin's 100th birthday and i said Really, Nathan, that's amazing. I said, who was Lenin? <laughs> and he said, I don't know. He said, he said he was a he was an old gentleman. He liked to sit, sit. He was an older gentleman. He had a beard. He said he sat on he, he would sit on a chair and have little children sit on his knee and tell him stories. And I thought that sounded very much like my Sunday school, you know pamphlets mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i said really i said you know what kind of stories did he tell i don't know he said but it was he's lennon and it's going to be his 100th birthday and they have bunting all over the city of 100th birthday for lennon so nathan that was nathan's i said nathan later i said you know nathan he went to law school i said you're going to have to you're going to have to take an ethics test and i <laughs> And I can, you better behave yourself or I can sabotage you. <laughs> you went to Lennon's 100th birthday party and celebrated really? his brand and I just, I just, yeah, and I just recently found the, the, the pictures of that. So, so oh, I have proof. <laughs> so you really do have some sabotage material. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, he, so, he, so I so just wonder really, what was like, what, what about that experience do you feel because I remember you said coming back from that it kind of changed your whole outlook on politics and and how yeah. what it means to be a citizen and and you know being active you know yeah. I'm just curious well, what, about what that. We, we, we were in a place where you where nobody really could say anything about the government that was negative that was it was against the law to, to say anything about the about this the government that was negative and of course it was pretty negative it was after it was the time when the russians were there again the warsaw mm -hmm. pact we we ended up with our red volkswagen little volkswagen in a convoy of russian tanks at one point wow. which felt a little uncomfortable 
Wow. But anyway, that. but there we were. And we, we had taken a, a uh, shortwave radio with us. And, and we listened every night. We listened to the Voice of America. This was during Nixon's regime, right? It was when, when, Kim, when the Vietnam War was really hot. And mm -hmm. we had just bombed Cambodia. And we were listening one evening to, to the Voice of America, the government-sponsored under Nixon radio program. And they were the, the panelist that was explaining why this was a stupid idea that we shouldn't have done this, you know, how bad that was. That, that they're on this public, on our government radio station, they were criticizing the president for in, in, in our defense department. So that must have been interesting to be over there where you couldn't say a word and hear exactly. what was happening in America, the criticisms of what the government was doing. Yeah. And we thought, well, democracy is still alive in the United States at least. You know, and it really didn't, it did make me think democracy is pretty frail. Certainly their little, their, their little experiment with, with, um, with uh, socialism with the human face was was smushed by the by by the Warsaw Pact, and they were really suffering. But 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 it seemed to me you have to fight. You, we we were in a position where we could we could fight that. And I also thought, could that ever happen in the United States? I I thought no, people are too feisty for that. But I'm wrong about that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, that really that really was my you know push for me, and I had already. We already had some experience in political organizing from Ann Arbor. You know, mm -hmm. when I finished my dissertation, I had my doctor's degree, and the kids were going to go off to school full time, and and I thought I could do something different now, yeah. and that that I should do this because I was interested in, and and had the motivation, mm -hmm. and that's why I feel I still feel very strongly about that. Mm -hmm. You know, we we need to protect ourselves. Yeah. From that kind of tyranny. Yeah, well, <laughs> not to get too political here, but I'm certainly glad that we've had a regime change here <laughs> recently. So hopefully, yes. Yes, I think well, a lot of things happened that no one thought was going to happen in our country over the past few years. So few years. I hope that we've uh, learned a lesson, you know. Well, we, we can't let down. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. You just can't let let you can't write it like, you know, I guess it's kind of what I was saying in some ways about Bloomington being almost complacent in the way everything was going along so well. Yes. Because it's almost like, I know in some ways for me even, you know, you just, oh no, we have a good overseeing, you know, we've, we've elected good people, which, you know, I mean, I, I do think they're good people, but, you know, you got to keep your eye on everything because, yeah. You know, it's just part of being an active citizen, you it know, is. to, yeah. so, so I, I was impressed with how well you listened to people and really considered their views. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Let's see, I've got some other, I was just <clears throat> wanting to hear a little bit more about your time on the, um, the Monroe County as a Monroe County Commissioner, I'm well, kind of jumping was, all over the place, but I mean, it's just, it's, there was so many incarnations of all the things you've done. What is, that's what I said, in, inadvertently, I said, I've lived a lot. I've lived one life, many lives. <laughs> yeah, I like that. And Michael picked that up. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's true. I feel that way. But uh -huh. the County Commissioners was certainly, a, that was a totally different thing. You know, yeah. I had run, I had run for Congress and I lost. And probably thought, just by a small margin, though. Well, it was about, you know, about eight points, maybe for 40, 45 percent. Anyway, it was enough to, to be didn't need to recount anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I thought, well, that's it for politics. I'll try to think of something else to do. But then I got phone calls from from I remember I was standing in the kitchen on the ladder and taking wallpaper off the wall, very old wallpaper and it was yellow, it was ugly. And, and I got a phone call from the mayor, from Frank McCloskey. And he said, Charlotte, he said, have you ever thought of running for county commissioner? 
I said, Frank, of course I haven't thought of that. Why would I think of that? And he said, well, you should, you know, there's Bill Hanna's running for his third term. He said, and he's, he, 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 he would be hard to beat, but I think you could do it. And I said, well, okay. Well, thank you, Frank. I appreciate your, your blah, blah, blah. And then I hung up and then I got a phone call from the former mayor, Mary Alice Dunlap, who never called me before. She said, Charlotte, I think you should run for county commissioner. I said, Mary Alice, I don't know anything about county government. I, how could I do that? She said, well, you didn't know much about city government and you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I said, you know, the, the county is a big county. Anyway, I got more and more phone calls and I began to think about it and think, well, that might be interesting, especially because Bill Hanna was, was, not, was somebody who did not listen to people. There was a big thing about trucks running down Kirby Road to a siding to take limestone to, to the Miram plant, which was just being built for scrubbers. And the people on Kirby Road were all Republicans, but they, they were so angry. <laughs> And they and they went to the county to the commissioners, and they and Bill Hanna just told them to shut up. And I thought, oh, no, you can't do it that way. Maybe there, maybe I should run. And then I started going to the commissioners' meeting, and he was rude to everybody, you know, and and thoughtless. And and I, be, you know, began to think about it. And then we un gradually, a couple of graduate students from SPIA came to help Frank's. Frank sent them to help me organize. And we started or thinking about getting a campaign together. And I liked to campaign, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. So I found myself back out on the county roads <laughs> and walking up the streets and, and knocking on doors again. And uh -huh. pe people were, well, he was hard to beat, but, mm -hmm. but I beat him. That's really interesting because the county county demographics are, are so different than the, you know, the town demographics. So yeah. it's it's pretty amazing that, that you did, you know, that's. Well, and in, in that, that was the two, that was the year 1980, that was the Reagan landslide. And in <laughs> fact, I had to get 9,000 more votes than Carter did in this county in order to, oh. to, to beat, beat Bill Hanna. But I did. I, mm -hmm. I, I must have said the right thing or done the, run the right thing. Well, anyway, it definitely I, sounds I, like. I, or ask the right questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or ask Listen the right to the right people, you know? I mean, people weren't being listened to. So my guess is they were, their feathers were pretty ruffled at, at that, you know? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, then, of course, then I had to be a county commissioner. Yeah. And then. And there I was, I was the first woman in this county to be a commissioner. And, you know, I mean, don't tell me, don't you think that I wasn't reminded of that? But, but I, uh, I, I, once again, I had some Republicans helping me, you mm -hmm. know, running, of course, there, I had to have them. Some of them were running, were helped me, some of them running against me to, to unhelp me. But, but, uh, but there were some issues that came along and I created some, some task forces, the highway department. I wanted to make sure that we were running the de highway department at top, pro appropriately because there were people in the highway department that were very disgruntled that we came clear that there were major, there were issues that there were between the workers. Mm -hmm. There were some tensions there. And I asked, I asked a bunch of, I, I created a drill task, blue ribbon task force that included mainly Republicans who were good at running things and, and, and who knew something about automobiles and about vehicles and, and that kind of management. And I asked them if they would just look at, look things over and see how things were being run because the, um, the county highway superintendent was not did not like me. He was and was very and his wife was very angry with me. Although she she was afraid I'd fire him, I guess. But I wasn't going to fire him outright. I had to have him. So anyway, 
So they went out and they did a real study of how the, how the county highway was running. And they came back and said, well, you've got employment issue, but the county, but the highway department itself is run, being run very well. And so I had to say, okay, fine. And what, what happened then is I called on the AFSCME, the American, the, the union, and I asked them to help us organize mm -hmm. the workers so that they, that the workers would have some, some more say in what was happening to them. And we, and that they, they, they elected to, to have a union. This is management doing this. Yeah. And he, but it worked because in fact, that, that, that organized the grievances. We had a pattern to, to a way, a systematic way to deal with grievances. And so it, it gradually that turned, well, all I can say is that I have a chair over here that, that we, we were throwing away when we built, we, we did the courthouse. And, and Jim Sargent dragged that out of the wreckage and put it together and sanded it and, and varnished it and, did it and gave it to me. Oh, that's neat. So, yeah. So that was nice. So, so was it, what, were you the person that came up with this way of dealing with grievances that, that hadn't been in place before? Well, I just realized that there had to be, they had to be dealt, dealt with mm -hmm. in a way that was, did, made everybody feel comfortable with it, that, that they right. were all being heard. And it seemed to me the union was good at that. Do you want to, to close the door? Brandon, Brandon, Ashley, would you close the door to the kitchen? Would you mind closing the door? Excuse me. No, it's okay. One of the other things that um, I thought was unique and, and really effective, probably one of the reasons why you've been so effective is that you did do a lot of um, bipartisan work. And then also when someone, like it, it was interesting to me to read about the dynamics back and forth between you and Frank McCloskey. And, and <laughs> it does, I guess it seems like you just don't hold a grudge, you know? And I thought that was really cool. Cause you know, boy, that's in politics, that's not always the case. So, so you were able to kind of go head at head or whatever with some people and then later on just work completely fine with them. Yeah, I will, I will. And in fact, you'll be interested to know that last week I invited Tommy Ellison over for coffee. Really? I, I was wondering how you got along after reading um, more and more through the book. <laughs> well, we, 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 she's never forgiven me for being right, but I decided <laughs> this is the time to be, get back in touch. And I just invited her to come come over and talk to her about zoning because I knew we were on the right side on that, the same side. Yeah. On that. Yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, I don't hold it. So I wish I could be a fly on that wall. <laughs> it was, well, you, 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 she talked to me the whole time. But anyway, I don't hold a grudge. I don't know why. And somebody has accused me of being able to talk to, to deal with people I don't like. And I said, of course, that, that's, 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 I mean, of course, what, what else do we do in this world? Mm -hmm. We have to, some people, I, I don't think I'd be last in the room with Donald Trump. <laughs> but aside from that, you know, that's a fairly extreme. That's a very extreme. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Right. Well, but, gosh. But, I, but, but in fact, county commissioner, then they said, okay, Charlotte, you, we've been around for a while. See, and Phil will do. Well, here, here's a nice thing that happened. I don't know if this is in the book, is it? You can tell me. Okay. Um, one of the early issues on the, as, as I was a county commissioner, was that the people who live on Baby Creek Road, which is off of bottom of um, mm -hmm. I know where Bertie, is. Bertie Gillian. Uh -huh. yeah. Anyway, they, they were being flooded. It was a very cold winter. And they and the creek goes like this, and yeah. they they couldn't get out easily. Yeah, I knew people who used to paddle in their boats to get out of that road. Yeah, well, anyway, they called the the county council member who lives was in that area called and said, 
I want you to come down and see this. And so the, all three commissioners went. We, we went out there in a Jeep and we, we, we bounced along the thing. And we brought the county highway engineer who was there then along. And, and, and when we got back, I said, so is this a county road? And they said, they said yes. I said, it's platted. Yes, it is. Um, and I said, and what are our plans for fixing it? <laughs> and they, we don't have any plans for fixing it. It's impossible. I said, is it really impossible? And they said, well, no, but it would cost some money. I, I said, I suppose it would. How much would it cost? And how would you do it? You know, and they said, well, we'd have to buy these large pipes, these corrugated pipes and put it in and then put some sort of surface on. And we could do that. I said, so what, what would it cost? And they said, well, I can't tell you right now. I said, could you prepare a plan for the next county, county commissioner's meeting? And we'll talk about it then. And I said to the Baby Creek people, I said, would you please come to the next meeting and so that we have your complaints on the, in the minutes. So we have a record of that. And so that's all, that all happened. And, and, and they- uh, What year they, was that, that? That was like 1982, 82. Yeah. And so they came and he, and he came and he brought us thing. And so I asked them to, you know, to explain their concerns and ask him to make a presentation and what it would cost. And I said, so that's, so that's $5,000. I said, could that be done in stages? Well, sure. But, but, you know, you don't want to do this. It's a waste of money. And one of my fellow commissioners, the Democrat, I might add, said, oh, Charlotte, he said, they're, they're just trying to take you. You're just a patsy. He said, they knew when they moved to that place that that, that that wouldn't work. And he said, they'll never pay enough taxes to make that worthwhile. And I said, Warren, I didn't think that's the way it worked. I thought we put all our money into taxes and then we did the work that needed to be done. And he, he poo-pooed me. So anyway, the, the third commissioner was a Republican, Phil Rogers, very, very taciturn. He never said anything. The guy I beat, beat him down. He bullied him. Ah. And, and uh, that evening, Phil Rogers called me at home. Big surprise. And, and I said, he says, hello, Charlotte. He said, this is Phil Rogers. I said, hi, Phil. How are you? And he said, well, he said, I'm calling because the meeting this morning, he said, what Warren said was wrong and what you said was right. He said, and if you could make a motion, I'll, I'll, he said, we're, we're there to work for the people. I said, and if you make a motion, I'll second it. And so and imagine that. And so we became allies, actually. There were several wow. issues, big issues where we, where we, where I made the motion and he seconded it. Interesting. Boy, that's just sad that it doesn't work that way anymore you know where you just come together and and talk and it doesn't matter what the party is that you yeah you know, well, was, do what's right you know yeah and i you know warren and i still became more friends years later he told me it was one of the better, better things he'd ever done anyway <laughs> yeah i remember him <laughs> i definitely you know, he was an interesting guy and i liked him he was he was a liberal. We agreed on so many things, but not on everything. Yeah, yeah. All. And 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 that's true of so many people. We we agree on everything, not everything, but some things that are important. But in this way, Phil and I really agreed on on that basic issue of doing things for the people. Right. And and how many terms did you serve? Two. Two. Okay. Yeah. Two. And at the end of two, I was exhausted. Yeah, I can only imagine. I'd seen enough incinerators. Yeah, yeah. And, and but then there, there was another wonderful experience. There was this guy, Don Wagner. When I was on the city council, the last, the last meeting that we had when I was on the city council in 1975, we passed the Gay Rights Amendment. And that a gay rights amendment for the city human rights commission. 
wow. young man. And that was, we had a young man, Brian de Saint Croix, who was president, who was a, he was the youngest person I think ever to serve on the city council. And, and the stupid me, he was gay. I didn't even, I didn't even realize it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it, the, there, a group of gay guys came to the city and asked for a building permit to, to fix up a for storefront as a cafe for gays, as a coffee house. And the, the building inspector would not give him a permit. Wow. For that reason, and so and so they went to Brian and Brian wrote an wrote an amendment to the ordinance and we you brought it to us and it it, it got to, uh, to the floor and it got into the you know the newspaper and so forth and the town went ballistic. <clears throat> it, it, it I don't think that was in the book. This this story. I don't think it, it wasn't. Yeah, mm -mm. but but it really wasn't. It was it's in the book that I'm still working on. Mm -hmm. And the way this this Don Wagner was was a a cons very conservative fundamentalist Christian, and and he 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 took out ads against us. I mean the the the, the re reaction was just violent, it was vitriolic, and and he there was he took out an ad that was fringed with with red red ink of fire we're going to burn in hell and i was a jezebel yeah anyway so so anyway we went ahead with it and and it came to the meeting and at that meeting only five of us of the county of the city council members showed up we needed five votes plus the mayor to to pass it and the mayor was on board we knew that mm -hmm. so we, we it was hilarious. The, the, there was this huge group of people with, with, with reading out of the Old Testament, and we read out of the New Testament. And we, we had this, this, we had the debate, and, and we passed it. We passed the amendment, and Frank signed it. So, so that went into the, into the, on the books. And That's that amazing was, for the time, you know. It was, it was very early. Yep, but I—I I mean, there was there was never a question in my mind but to pass it, and mm -hmm. the other, the other several were also had, had backgrounds of of, of religion. Interesting, one one was a Presbyterian minister, and one was a, El Tal was a was a Baptist boy boy evangelist, and we had a, a Jewish member. No, he didn't come that day. Anyway, we all have backgrounds of, you know, we're connected with the churches. Uh -huh. anyway, so we passed it and we survived. And when I became a county commissioner, lo and behold, Don Wagner was on the county council. He had gone, got himself elected. And so I, and I don't know, you know how county government works. You can, the commissioners can pass anything, but they, as Don Wagner told me, We've, we work by the golden rule. Those, those of who's got the gold does the ruling. Mm. So what he meant is the county council has to pass any ordinance, any financial expenditures mm. if, if the county commissioners are going to get anything done. Mm -hmm. so, so there I was facing him on the county council. And over a period of time, I, we became friends, uh, just putting it short. Yeah, over a while, over times, so we, we became friends. Wow. And I, and I worked very hard to, to you know, to woo him and, mm -hmm. and the other members of the council, because I knew if we're going to get something done, we've got to get along. Mm -hmm. and, and we needed to get, we needed to restore the courthouse, you know. We, need, we, we needed to create a veteran service office. We needed to do a whole bunch of different things. And to stop this, to stop the incinerator. Anyway, down the line, we became friends. And, and in 1987, the Supreme Court, well, when I ran for Congress, let's go step one. When I ran for Congress, the, uh, I tried to go to, to service clubs to speak, but the male service clubs would not let me speak. 
but my opponent, of course, could go in anytime he wanted to, but they weren't going to have women speaking. And in 1987... Because you're a woman? Yes. Yes. And then in 1987, the United States Supreme Court had a case whether or not whether or not um, women should be members of it should be members of service clubs, and they said yes that they made they made it mandatory that they had to admit women because it was a it was a tax it's discrimination thing. it was a tax thing um. it was money see because because male members de re use use their dues as a um, you know, to 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 as a tax to get out. Oh, of I see. So they could use it as a as a tax, tax write off. De de deduction. Yeah, yeah deduction. But and, the women and, couldn't. But oh. the women couldn't. So that was discriminatory. Yes. So anyway, in 1988, the uh, the the local republic re Rotary clubs and in Kiwanis and so forth had to admit women. And Don Wagner asked if I he would if I would let him sponsor me to the Rotary Club. Wow. Isn't, isn't that a nice story? That is a great story. You know, I wish I wish you could teach people how to be effective politicians. You know, I just think hearing these stories is heartwarming. You know, I mean, it's like it's how it should be, and it's so far from how it is anymore. Yeah, it should be this way. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so I we I work I continue to work at it. Uh huh. Well, good because you have a really important voice, and I think people really respect and um, will listen to you. So I'm glad you're writing this book that you're writing. I think that's important. Yeah, I mean, and it's almost done. Almost done. Really? Do you know who will publish it? No, I don't. I, we probably will end up self-publishing. I don't mm -hmm. know. It, it isn't IU press was going to do it but he didn't want to he didn't want to he didn't think that two books by Charlotte Zillow would be would be sellable so he he withdrew his offer hmm. so but well it's okay we'll get it done yeah yeah um I just one thing I just wanted to say is one of my really good friends and I was I was happy to see you mention him and give him credit and the book what is Stephen Higgs um, yes. and he worked really hard uh you know to oh, oh I, do, I know yeah yeah so I was really happy to see that that you had um, mentioned him he was I think he was an HT reporter at the time right yes, yes. but um I know that's always been such a big deal to to him and he really admires and thanks you for your work too well, he was he was really a, you know he really helped me in the in the incinerator business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope he's okay. I haven't heard from him for years. Yeah, he he's doing well. He teaches. Um, he's an adjunct professor professor of journalism at IU, uh, so he right. does that. And he's written two incredibly good guidebooks: um, yes. Natural Indiana, North North and South. And um, they're really, really good. I sell a lot of them at my gallery. They're very really? good books. That's good to know. Yeah. Say hello to him for me. I will. Yeah. I will. So he he was with us on that trip when we went to uh, to Little Rock. Oh yeah, and, was and, he? I, I didn't realize that he was. When somehow we got the IU jet to take us to Little Rock and go to see see the incinerator at El Dorado, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And then we went from there to Houston where we saw the okay. where we saw the incinerator that where where John Langley found out that that we were going to need not only that when he talked about the well the guy there said, so how many how many cubic cubic gallons of, of in you know liquid yes yeah. yeah steve was on that trip oh okay see i didn't realize that yeah, yeah you talked about the trip in the book but i didn't know he was yeah. along that's that's interesting good well life is really interesting it is isn't it and i think you chose a perfect title the the one life many lives because you've certainly had your share and it's been such a gift to us all
Well, it looks like you, we're Gina. coming up on on the end of our hour, but okay. I really want to thank you. Is there anything you want to say just before we sign off that we didn't get to talk about? Well, you had such a wonderful shop and you know that I'm sorry that it's not here anymore. Well, I'm sorry it's not in Bloomington too, but you know, Owen County is is an up and coming and Spencer Square is really, really cute. And, yeah. You know, well, it's affordable for me. I can actually afford the the rent. So that's good. why I'm here is is because there's good people here and I want to see the arts uh, flourish here in Owen County too. Yeah. So and I think they will. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Best of, best of luck to everybody. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Glenda, for being on this. Yeah. Tell Bill we love him. And Ransom, Hale, thank you for being here, even though we couldn't see or hear you. And thank did you so he, much, did Charlotte. Any, did he have any questions? Uh, he hasn't written any, so I don't okay. think so. But um, he, maybe he he's a fan, agree. so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you, if you have any questions down the line, just get in touch with me, okay, Jamie? I will, and I look forward to your new book coming out. Good. 